Welcome back, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, if you want to support this venture, you could go to the Substack, oxum.substack.com. You could join the YouTube channel directly and support at many different levels, or you could go to patreon.com slash tawahado, T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. Today, my special guest is Terion Flash Ware. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Of course. First off, just because it's uh, it's funny, we've been Facebook friends uh, for a minute. We've probably been on different comment threads, but I was curious in the first place. I looked the the mutual we had was uh, my boy Henok. Did y'all grow up together? Yeah, we went to uh, I went to middle school with him and um, and high school. We played basketball together and we're on the same track team. Oh yeah, he's nice. I played basketball with him. Yeah, he's one of the best players I've ever played with, dude. He's just so technical. <laughs> yeah, just just uh, we just had a at our church. We just had a little baptism for his baby boy the other day. So shout out to you, Henok, and to Heyman. Um, <laughs> so that's funny. That's funny. Yeah, and then we had the same name. But then I also happen to be into MMA. So when uh, when an MMA fighter uh, and I just became friends on there, I was like, oh, this is crazy. This is this is yeah. dope. Uh, I want I want to talk a little bit about MMA, and then we jump into the the weight loss journey, so people can make sense of it. Because I think a lot of us have had the the mean quarantine fifteen. If if I could speak for myself, I know I gained about twenty pounds in quarantine, and I like to kid myself into thinking about thirteen pounds with muscle and seven maybe fat but the, the ratio might be a little different than that <laughs> um so how, how did you how did you get into mma because you're talking about basketball and you talk about other sports how, how long have you been in in the mma game and i know you you had a a, a little stint too from uh, 2017 to 2018 in, in the biggest arena which most people confuse for the name of the sport in the first place the ufc <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, the the first two sports I ever did was, was soccer and karate. And so, for me, I was always kicking, you know, at a young <laughs> age. And um, and then growing up, you know, playing, you know, Little League Baseball and, and other sports and things like that. But I was always doing karate and, and, and boxing here and there off, just in the background, you know. Just my my grandmother, I, I, I was raised in, um, unfortunately, in a, in a really bad neighborhood, and mm -hmm. it wasn't much going on inside of that neighborhood if you're hanging out on the streets. So, you know, my mom and my grandmother, you know, they kept me occupied. They kept me busy. So if, when baseball would end, it was football. When football would end, it was track. When track would end, it was karate. So I was always doing something. And by the time I got to high school, uh, you know, my love for just traditional sports had kind of taken over the majority of my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. my boxing coach was like, hey, dude, if you want to box, you know, like, this has to be a full-time thing. It can't be, you know, hey, I got football practice today. I can't make it, things like that. And so, you know, at the time, you know, you know, obviously football, baseball, basketball, bigger sports. And so, you know, it's the one that gets the most girls and everything like that as well, too. So that's what I opted to do. And, I, and um, you know, in football, baseball, and basketball were, you know, my three major things. And I did track and field to, you know, to keep my speed up, you know, uh, and um, I mean, and baseball ended up being the sport that took me the furthest, just for height, weight, skill set, and everything. Too not tall enough to play basketball, not big enough to play quarterback uh, at a Division One, uh, uh, you know, college or anything like that. So uh, I took the baseball route, and that took me the furthest. Um, but then injuries just piled up, you know, um, and that was just an unfortunate thing. And I blew out my arm, and I couldn't quite, you know, uh, get it back to where to where it was. And my arm strength was one of the things that was a was a was a great tool for me that that scouts looked at. You know, my speed, defense, and my arm was was were the three things that you know that caught the eye of, of scouts and put me on the scouting report. So, and losing one of those tools, they made it really hard to kind of get you know put on a team um, and be in somebody's minor league system. And so, all that goes down the drain. I I end up playing semi pro football with a bunch of guys from high school that I played football with. Um, and then that year I broke my hand, tore my MCL. Oh, okay. Then I'm sitting on the sideline for a year and I just gained a bunch of weight. Got up to about 190 pounds, you know, feeling like shit, feeling sorry yeah. for myself. And then I was like, man, I, this can't be my life. Like, so at the time I'd been watching UFC for about two or three years. I got into it. And of course, with my natural love for fighting and karate and boxing kind of led me into that. And I've been watching and I was like, man, well, these guys are in shape. Like, I'm gonna go just do what they do with no intentions of actually competing. 
I thought maybe you know maybe maybe a year down the line after training I might take a fight, uh, but I just dove right into it. And coming from hey, the you went to an MMA gym first, or what type of gym you go to? Yeah, I went to an MMA gym. It was a it was a gym that was opened up in West LA called um, Academy Mixed Martial Science at the time, and uh, and at the time uh, Rich Franklin was supposed to be there for at the grand opening. And I'm like, all right, cool. I know who Rich Franklin is. I, I watched him. You know, I'm a fan of his. Be a good opportunity to go check out the gym and and maybe meet you know somebody that you know would want to meet. And uh, of course, he didn't show up. <laughs> mm. But I went to the gym anyways. Um, and he, he didn't show up not because he didn't like he just bailed. It was uh, during the time that Tito and and um, and Chuck were supposed to fight on the Ultimate Fighter, and Tito had to pull out, and Rich Franklin replaced him. So he literally had to like leave and go do that, and that's why he didn't show yeah. up. But I showed up to the gym, I took two classes, and I fell in love with it. And um, and for me, coming from all the sports that, I, that I've come from, you know, you play soccer or football, you have off-season camps, and you have camps in the middle of the season that was just like, you train for three, four, five, six hours a day. So I just figured in MMA, that's just what you do. <laughs> so I would come in, and I would take all the classes, and I would take five hours of classes, five classes in a row. Jeez. And uh, the coach there was like, hey, dude, like, you're training harder than – my fighters here, like, do you want to fight? Now, but this time, I, I'd only been there for about eight weeks. He's like, you're getting pretty good. I'm like, dude, I'm, I, I don't want to fight. I'm like, I just, I just want to get in shape, man. I came in here, I'm fat. I'm like, and he's like, no, man, like, you're losing weight. And at that time, I had lost like 16 pounds in like eight weeks. Um, cause that's all I knew. I just knew hard work. That's all I, that's, that's all I knew. For me, growing up, I was always the smallest dude on my team, so I had to work harder than everybody else. So that was my mindset. So I went in there, worked hard, lost the weight. Um, and he's like, no, nah, I think you'd be good. He kept pestering me for about a week. And finally he got me agreed to do with it. He's like, yeah, it's in eight weeks. You're going to have to lose like another 16 pounds and then you're going to fight. I'm like, Jesus Christ. So anyways, <laughs> I ended up doing it. I ended up doing it. Uh, I ended up having my first amateur fight after about four months of training, uh, and fought a guy who had a couple years of experience and did very well. I ended up losing by submission in the, in the third round. But, like, I was winning the majority of the fight for someone who only had, you know, a couple months of experience. And when the fight was over, um, and this my first fight was at Fight Academy with Savant Young, and, uh, you know, he's like, he told me, hey, man, if you anywhere want to come and train, you know, please come down, you know, and, and get some work with us. I'd love to work with you and help with your career. Um, I appreciate you coming out. You know, this is our first show in California, and we broke it off, and you put on a good fight. And, um, and Savant Young, if, for those who don't know, you know, legend in the sport, you know, was one of the guys in IFL and, you know, back in WEC, back in those days, you know, so, you know, I, you know, developed a friendship with him and kind of a mentorship with him as well, too, um, and kind of helped me start off my career and, and, and get my name out there, and next thing you know, I was, like, fighting, like, every five, six weeks, like, I had shelled out, like, 12 amateur fights in the first year, um, wow. uh, and I was just going and going and going, I just fell in love with it. And that was about 12 years ago. It'll be 12 years in August. And, uh, and I've been doing it ever since. And that's just what I've been doing for the last 12 years. And that's how I got started. That, that's amazing. I was, I was especially reflecting on what you were saying, the difference between like baseball, football, basketball, and MMA. And I think it'll lead kind of smoothly to what we're talking about. You mentioned a lot how you had to work harder because you said you were a shorter dude. You, you couldn't, um, you know compete with the, the giants out there. What do you think about the difference between those sports, how those sports don't have like weight divisions or like whatever the equivalent would be in terms of like height divisions versus how MMA, there are different divisions. And, and what did you, did you jump in at bantamweight or did you start at a different weight when you first came in? No. So, I mean, when I first started, honestly, I thought I was like, um, just at the weight, I was like, man, I'm going to be 155 pounds. Uh, a fighter and it's funny because like i can uh i gotta i would have to find it but um there's a uh there's a facebook post that i did like 12 years ago and me in a tap out shirt like double bicep flexing says on a journey <laughs> to be the best lightweight in the world and <laughs> and it's like now when i look back at it i was like damn man i was that heavy to where i thought like i was gonna be like fighting bj pan and um so uh but yeah, so but my initial first fight was at 145 because in the amateurs you don't really cut weight. Um, mm -hmm. 
but then the natural progression, just my just my size and body frame and training with guys that were, you know, you know, who were pro fighters and some guys that were in WEC or the UFC at the time or in other promotions, um, I was like, man, these, I can't, I'm, there's no way I'm going to be able to fight with these 45ers right now at the time. Maybe I might grow into that later on, um, which is kind of where I'm at right now. I'm thinking about moving up to 45, mm-hmm. maybe fluctuating <laughs> between 35 and 45. Uh, but at the time, it, it had to be 35. Um, but uh, going into it as far as like, the other sports was like, um, uh, there's such a discrepancy in terms of skill, and pos- each position requires certain skills where weight classes do uh, 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 wouldn't. I mean, weight classes wouldn't. It, it wouldn't. Um, it would hurt the sport um, in a sense, um, with the exception of maybe basketball, because. Mm-hmm watch pickup games you know on the street and you see everyone's a point guard and a shooting guard those games are fun to watch you know what i'm saying like if you watched an all-star game and you put you know the, all the best guards in the league and you know you know you had durant and lebron like as your big man that would be the most exciting basketball to watch everyone has handles everyone can shoot everyone can dunk um and so i think basketball uh might benefit from that and there's actually a, a league called a six foot and under league like a semi-pro league they do and um you, you will look up a couple of videos of those is pretty it's pretty exciting but you know just in the world of you know sports as tradition you know they're not going to lose the center you know yeah. in football yeah. you need linemen to block for you you need bigger guys um and so that's always probably going to be a thing where there's going to be a weight discrepancy and you just gotta something you gotta deal with that makes sense like the team aspect of it the certain roles the linemen got to be bigger. The tight end is like the buffest wide receiver. The wide receivers and the cornerbacks going to be a little thinner. That makes sense. Whereas MMA, it's all individualized. So right. It's easier to manage that. So it, throughout that time, you began learning more of the, the craft of MMA. And part of that, I know one championship does things a little differently out in uh, Southeast Asia. But here stateside, a lot of times there's a, there's a weight cutting culture. So you, you learned a bunch of techniques on how to, to make weight, right? Because you're making 135, but you, you still weigh about 145 to 155 when you're in the cage or the, or the octagon, right? Right. Like when I step in the cage, yeah, I'm anywhere from, from, you know, my lightest is 148. The heaviest, I was 156. So you're mm-hmm. putting on anywhere from about, you know, 13 to 18 pounds of weight on the next day and you have to go compete and you have to do it scientifically. You got to know your body. And a lot of it is trial and error as well too, because everyone is different. Some people cut weight more efficiently than others. Um, and, uh, some, some people don't, some probably, have, some people have different body composition. People who carry, carry more muscle, their muscles hold more water, easier for them to drain and put that back on. Someone who carries more fat, maybe around their midsection or maybe in their legs, it's a little bit harder to drain that, that water out because your body wants to hold on to that water. So for guys, you know, you know, you see a guy in the cage and one guy, they both weighed in at 155 and you're looking and, and when they get back into the cage, you go, okay, well, that guy's clearly much bigger than him. So at that point for, you know, each person's career is individualized. You got to figure out, um, you know, what's the best avenue for you? What, what do you, do you drop, you know, more weight or do you, you know, try to drop less weight and just focus on being stronger and have more cardio, more footwork? And things like that, and and you and you see a, a mix of it. You see some guys move up, and they do great. You see some guys move down, and they do great. But for the most part, what you see is when guys move down, they don't do as well. You see more mm-hmm. guys who move up do a lot better, and it's just because they're not draining themselves. Like when you're in camp, you know, I, I have been in camp with you know guys that you know who are world class, who you wouldn't believe. You watch their camp, and you go, oh, the majority of your camp, you're just spending losing weight. Like you're not training. <laughs> Um, but you're just so physically talented and so good, like you're able to get away with it for the most part. But then you run into somebody who is just as physically talented, just as hard working, but they spend their entire time in their camp working on their skill and they lose weight as a result of the training. Um, those guys face off and the guy that's concentrating on the skill dominates the competition more often than not, you know? And so I think with 1FC, I've been, you know, <laughs> The first time I had to cut weight and step on a scale, I was like, why the hell are we doing this? <laughs> this is stupid. I'm like, 
And then the one FC model come out and like, why aren't we doing this? And it's just one of those things where I think where things have been done a certain way for so long, for whatever reason, people just are just, they wait for a long time to actually change it. Yeah. Um, and so I think with the success that one FC is having and the more success they're going to have, they're going to continue to have where, you know, guys are not dropping out of fights. Guys are not, you know, getting seriously injured, like brain damage and things like that because they can't take a punch because they drain themselves. You know, guys' chins are a little bit better. Performances are better. I think the UFC and um, is just going to follow suit. Um, here in California, I know, you know, the guy Andy Foster, who's the head of the Athletic Commission, like, he's been a huge advocate and he's been trying as much as he can to, uh, to, to have guys where they don't cut weight. But it's one of those things where, yeah. you know, uh, if you're a promoter, and you're trying to put on a show, and it costs X amount of dollars, you put on a show, and now, you know, this guy is having trouble making weight or whatever the case may be, and you put all these restrictions on him being able to fight, now you show up, and all these guys, you got half your card gone. And That's then, right. Like, these guys right. tickets, you know, what are you supposed to do? So it's kind of like, you know, kind of a, there's kind of a, a template where you're supposed to follow but there's some leeway where they'll, they'll give you because they don't want to lose fights on a card because, you know, we got to put on a show, you got to make money, you got to pay officials, things like that and the other. So it becomes almost where, you know, the commissions are at the mercy of the, of the fighters if the fighters don't, you know, kind of abide by the rules being kind of set. It's either you just tell them to go home and there's no fights or, you know, you find them and give them a warning, but you let them fight anyways. And that happens more often than not. Yeah, I, I remember, I think it was it was Andy Foster who started this, where they started telling everybody what the weight of the fighter was in the actual arena. And it was funny because I remember one of the last fights that Thiago Santos fought at um, 185. I forget the name of the dude he was fighting, but the dude he was fighting weighed in at 189, and he was 209. And, you know, it's shortly after that that he starts fighting at 205. And that's funny that you weigh more than the listed weight class of the weight class above you, and you're fighting in this weight class. Like, that's that's just a funny kind of idea that's uh, going on. But like you said, we understand that people are so reticent to change. For me, when Big John McCarthy went on the Joe Rogan experience and explained the 12 to 6 o'clock elbow, that should have been gone. Like, that should have been deleted. And that thing is still right. there. <laughs> right, yeah. Like I said, it's just one of those things where it's like, because it's been a rule for so long, even though you know, like someone can explain it, explain it to you. It's explained over and over. And it's like, how are you not changing this? It's like you work at a supermarket, right? And you tell your manager, you got a giant spill on aisle 12. But no one picks it up, ever. <laughs> Like what are you like? What are you doing? Like it's 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 clearly a problem. You see, it's a problem, but you don't fix it. And I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. And you know, they. My thing is too. What 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 makes me mad is like, is they'll do other certain things, right, and give us other restrictions on things that actually might benefit us, but tell us that, that we can't do it because it's for our safety. Mm -hmm. Yet you're letting your guy cut twenty five pounds of water in 12 hours and fight the next day and get kicked in the head. Yeah, so where's not. the, where's, where's the safety monitoring when it comes to that? You know, but you know, we had to fight for the longest where fighters wanted to use, you know, CBD and use cannabis as opposed to using fucking painkillers and things like that. Um, but you outlawed it and you wouldn't let it happen even after it was, and most states have been accepted and has been made legal you still had all these restrictions on it because of safety, even though it's been shown to where it's actually safer to do CBD or use cannabis as an anti-inflammatory or as a painkiller, as opposed to me being on opioids or, you know, or uh, ibuprofen, which obviously, you know, if you Google or, you know, if you've been awake in America for the last 20 years, we clearly have a pill popping problem here in, in this country. And so, I don't know, man. I just, I wouldn't even know who to even write a letter to, who to talk to. I know. Or, I'm it's, sure, it's like you I'm said, sure the I'm issue is that each state has its own commission and they have their own control because UFC has now finally decriminalized weed alongside everybody else. 
but right. now like Nevada and stuff could still prohibit it, you know? And I think that's right. what they're still gonna do, which is crazy because we haven't seen a Nick Diaz fight in so all these years. Because of that last fight where, you know, Anderson popped for some other stuff, but then he popped for weed. And that's when he was laying down on the ground and stuff. It was, <laughs> but, but it's such yeah, a man. ridiculous thing. Like, and, and then uh, who was it? It was uh, Bisbing was getting on the commentator and he was saying, well, it's, a, it's a actually an enhancing drug. It's, it's a PED. <laughs> he said cannabis is a PED. <laughs> yeah, but so is Datorade. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like, yeah. so obviously we have, obviously, my thing is, is you have supplements and stuff that people use that are okay. And you have some that are not. So the way I classify thing is, is if I took something and I sat there and did nothing, if I get benefits out of it, that shit should be illegal. Mm -hmm. However, if I take something and I sit there and I don't do anything and I don't get anything out of it, not a performance and acting drug. If I sit there and I drink Gatorade and I don't go out and do cardio to build up my cardiovascular system, nothing happens. Gatorade in fact, you'll be, be fatter from the sugar. Right. Gatorade should, it should not be on a band's list. Now, if I sit there and I take testosterone or I take steroids and I sit there, I can fall asleep and I'm going to wake up stronger. I'm going to wake up where my body has lot, dropped body fat a lot faster. There's things you can take where, you know, diuretics and things like that, where you lose mm -hmm. water a lot easier and things like that. So I, classif I try to classify what should be on the band's list as, as I think it's, it's plain and simple when it, when it comes to that. And, of course, there's obviously a whole host of other things and things that, you know, way you know, smarter scientists are out there smarter than me can figure out what should be on the band's list. But when it's clear and, and it's evident, like, dude, like, you can sit there and smoke weed and sit on the couch, like, it ain't doing shit. It ain't going to do nothing for you but make you just want to go eat chips and get fat anyway. <laughs> so, Nick Diaz, you know, smokes a whole blunt of sativa and goes does a fucking triathlon, so be it. He could have he could have drank a whole bottle of Gatorade and did the same thing or put it in a camelback and did the same thing and you wouldn't complain. But just the stigma behind it because, because it's a plant. Okay, well, ibuprofen comes from a plant. So there's painkillers. You know, but... It's just these stigmas that have been in place for such a long time that even after we get the facts, it takes you a long time for them to go, okay, let's change this. And so hopefully just some of those things that we have in our sport, like the 12 to 6 elbow, like the weight cutting, universally it's just a matter of time before people go, okay, this shit is stupid. Let's change the rule. Hopefully and it's, hopefully it's before I retire, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you still got some. I mean, look at, look at Yoel Romero, man. He got at least yeah. what a decade on you, and Anderson is still out there. And uh, what's his uh, what's his name? The light heavyweight who's waiting around right now, uh, the Brazilian one. He's submitting everybody. Oh, oh my uh, God, Glover, yeah. Glover, yeah. Glover Teixeira, yeah. Glover Teixeira. Yeah. So um, that's very like it's very inspiring that we're seeing some of the changes now. But like you said, you'd like it to happen while you're still fighting, and we're seeing everything going on. A lot of uh, like women on Twitter were saying, oh, no, Corona took my beauty years away. But for athletes, this is like a year of their prime going away. How, how did you, you know, respond? Your gym's then all closed. Do you have to like train privately? Do you take a bunch of time off? Because you, you are very public, and I appreciate that you're public about it, at least semi-public on Facebook, because a lot of people, they don't want to show that side of it. But you you had even the pictures, and were showing how you, you dropped from, like, 170 to 162. You, show, you showed how you, you blew up. So what, what happened that you got out of shape, and uh, what inspired you to kind of share the journey of, of whipping yourself back into shape? Honestly, me, I just, I convinced myself, and probably rightfully so, I, needed, I just needed a break. And it was an opportunity for me to get a break. Uh, there was a lot of other things going on in my life outside of, um, outside of fighting that were, you know, you know kind of, you know, that had to be addressed. And for me, I put fighting so much on a high pedestal because obviously you have to. You know, you have guys that sleep into the gym that every day they're focusing on trying to kill you. If you're not 100% focused on that, it's dangerous. And so... You know, I focused so much of my, you know, 10, 10 and a half years at the time, 11 years of just focusing on that and having a son and having a daughter uh, and, and having a family, having a wife, like, 
that takes uh, it can take a, it, it takes a toll on those things, and I didn't focus on those things, and some of those things were being affected because of that. And here was an opportunity. Okay, well the world shut down. I can't fight anyways. Let me just spend more time at home. And so when Beautiful. my personal training gym shut down and I can't go to work, it's like okay, I wake up. I play with the kids, I play video games, this, that, and the other. You go out to the park, run around with them, do that. The next thing you know, it's, you've done a whole day's of stuff, but it's 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Now what do you do? <laughs> now, now it's your opt to you, know, you, you, you grab a Truly or you grab, you know, a drink or you grab, you know, you, 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 know, you, grab, you kick back, grab some weed and, 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 and play some video games, you eat chips, and now it's 7 o'clock, and now you, you and your wife are watching shows all night. It's 2 a.m. because you ain't got to get up. And so it just became a pattern, and that pattern kind of happened. And then I was like, okay, maybe after about four weeks, I'm like, all right, I got back in the gym. I started lifting weights because even though the gym still closed, I have, I have private access to my gym where I can come in here by myself. I don't have to wear a mask. I can, I can work out. And I just started lifting weights and doing a little bit of cardio. And then I stopped doing any cardio, and it was just only lifting weights. And then it was, okay, lifting weights and, and, getting, and eating. It was like, okay. Now I want to I want to see if I I want to see if I can get big how big I can get and then I'm gonna cut down and then I get up to 185 and I got muscle but I'm also fat as well too and then it's like I go out and I try to run a mile and my knees hurt and I'm like oh shit and it's just pat just you know just a bunch of excuses basically you know honestly you know I could I could sit here and cite all the things but it's all excuses and um it wasn't until it's was like okay man like now like you know now I feel like crap this is not me. You know, I'm watching fights. I'm getting motivated again. Okay, let's get back into the gym and let's let's get this weight off. And um and you know since January 1st, I was 180 and now I'm 162. So I've lost 18 pounds since January 1st. That's um, incredible. And, you know that was kind of I've never been a New Year's resolution guy, and to this day I'm still not. It's just that I was like, okay, this is a cool starting point right here. Let's boom, let's get it done. And so January 1st, I think it was like a Saturday or a Sunday or whatever. Um, you know, uh, you know, kind of had like a New Year's kind of kickback at my place. Um, that was the last little hoorah of pizzas and drinks and, and stuff like that. <laughs> and got it all in. Woke up the next day, felt like crap, and um, didn't want to do nothing. And it was like, okay, well, I'm gonna punish myself. And I went out and ran ten miles, and um, and that was the start of it. And so, uh, since January first, I've just been do- putting in two a days five, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week, um, uh, doing 16 hours a day fasting. So I, I don't eat oh, nice. from 10 o'clock. So from t- 10 o'clock at night, I have a protein shake, uh, a casein protein shake, because it's a slow digesting protein that helps feed my body for the next X amount of hours so that even though while I'm in my fasting state and my body's breaking down its own body fat, it's not breaking down my own muscle, I'm not feeling lethargic. Um, double shots of espresso coffee helps. <laughs> a lot of water. Um, but, yeah, I don't eat from uh, – I wake up, and I don't eat until, like, 2 p.m., and between 2 p.m. and 8 and 10 p.m. is an eight-hour window where um, I have uh, – where I can eat, and um, I'm eating about two big meals a day, and the rest are just kind of healthy snacks of, like, bananas, fruits, um, vegetables, and things like that. Um, what what do the big meals look like? Uh, the big meals look like uh, – it'll, like like, it'll be like a chicken salad. Uh, for the most part, and some sweet potatoes, or it'll be usually be a combination of some kind of protein, some kind of vegetable, and some kind of healthy starch, and usually I opt to, like, red potatoes or sweet potatoes. I kind of eat the same thing every day. It's, like, it's my go-to. That's good. That's good. And do you, do you feel a difference? I see some people arguing about, like, regular potatoes versus sweet potatoes and yams. Do, do you have any – you feel different when you eat either of those, or does it feel the same to you? It feels the same to me. Um, the sweet potatoes I prefer because I like the taste. Um, I like to add a little cinnamon to it as well too. Um, cinnamon is really good. It's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a health food spice that's really good for your blood, helps clean your blood. Um, and um, it's one of my secrets to having really good cardio. Um, but um, yeah, throwing cinnamon and honey in your in your in your oatmeal in the morning uh, for breakfast when I'm not doing the fasting, um, that's one of my go tos for you know before uh, you know a good training meal. It'll be mm-hmm. like some, you know, a half a cup of, or a cup of oatmeal, some half a sliced banana, some oatmeal, I mean, some um, some cinnamon and some honey. You have that, some good carbs, some good fiber, um, helps clean your blood, gets you going. And uh, that's one of my go-to breakfasts when I'm not doing intermittent fasting. But 
Um, yeah, I, I like the sweet potatoes, you know, more for the taste. But honestly, I don't, I don't notice a difference. It's a starch. It's, it's if you do the comparisons, um, for the most part, they're pretty similar in terms of their macronutrients. Uh, however, um, sweet potatoes will have a couple more different nutrients like vitamin E and other things like that that are good for your skin and things like that. Yeah. But don't really bear any weight on um, as far as like you know losing or gaining weight. Yeah, yeah. I I use some vitamin E uh, face cream. Shout out to my girl. She gave it to me on the side. Uh, so vitamin yeah. E is definitely important for that to keep the ash away. So absolutely. <laughs> for that aesthetic, you gotta keep the money maker going, right? For when you do media. Yeah. Man, seriously. <laughs> So that's that. That's dope, man. Is there is there anything um, that you know in terms of things open up here in LA, or anything you want to announce or plug as we close out here? No, I mean, I mean, like, uh, you know, I, I mean, I've been posting more on my social media. Some of the restrictions are listed. You know, here at my gym, you know, we have the outside training and inside training available. When people are inside, we got to keep the distance. Everyone has to keep their mask on and things like that. We wipe down everything constantly every hour. Uh, uh, you know, we encourage clients, you know, to wipe down, you know, wash their hands, you know, whenever they're using the equipment. Uh, we've been open off and on uh, since June. I mm -hmm. uh, haven't had a single trainer or a single client test positive. Um, Beautiful. You know, Beautiful. And, uh, and I can say, you know, that's going to attribute to, you know, to us, you know, taking all the necessary precautions and taking it as seriously as possible. Now I get myself te tested, you know, every, we every, every week or every other week. Mm -hmm. Um. I actually think I probably had it maybe like in the beginning of this, in December before it came out. I got really, really sick. And I know a lot of people were, were, were saying that they got really sick before everything shut down and came out. So I might have antibodies. I'm waiting for the free antibodies test to come out because I'm not paying 150 bucks for them to tell me something that I, know. I really, you know I, I did that. Saying? I paid for that antibody test for my blood and they're like, oh, you ain't got it. And I was, I was yeah. mad. I got my yeah. first dose a few weeks ago. I'm supposed to get my second one soon. So nice. we'll see yeah. I'll be getting Nice. Yeah, I should be getting mine soon in the next couple of weeks, and that'll open up a lot more for me to be able to go out and train. But um, yeah, there's some there's some spots here and there. I mean, I don't want to mention because I don't know if I'm supposed to mention. Yeah. So I just, I'll, just, I'll, just, uh, I'll just I'll just mention you know my gym here. You know, South my personal training gym, South Bay Trainer. Uh, that's where I've been mostly doing you know all of my strength and conditioning and stuff that you've seen posted on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. That's where I'm doing all of that here. Um, if you see me without my mask on. It's because no one else is in there. I'm not, you know, I'm not breaking any rules. Um, but you will see me with my mask on if other people are in the gym. Um, but like I said, yeah, we have, you know, we're here on PCH and Hawthorne Boulevard. We have outside training available. We have inside training available, but you must wear a mask. Um, and, uh, you know, people can hit me up on the DMs and, you know, and if they want to come in and, you know, and, and get some of that quarantine weight off. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I'm doing it myself. This, I'm a professional at it. This is, this is what I do. If you're expecting to lose eight pounds in seven days, I, I put a disclaimer up. I'm not going to teach you how to do that. It's not for the faint at heart. It's not. I, I'm taking about 15 to 16 different supplements while I'm doing this. So uh, money's coming out of my pocket to be able to do this, but um, it's an investment for me because on the flip side of it, when I do get a fight, I'm going to make all that money back. If you have no interest in fighting, if, you're, if getting in shape doesn't pay you um, other than uh, pay you back health wise and long terms, you know, just feeling good wise. That's what you should be focused on. If it doesn't pay you monetary wise, don't try to do what I'm doing. Do it at a slower weight. It's better for you. It's healthy for you. Uh, doing the way that I'm doing it, um, it if not done in the in the in the right fashion, it can be very unhealthy for you. Um, so don't ask me about losing eight pounds in seven days. I'm not going to do it. But if someone wants to come in and lose, you know, two pounds a week. Uh, that's totally doable, and you do the math, whatever your goal is, you need to lose 50 pounds, I can show you how to lose two pounds per week, 25 weeks, you can hit your goal, if that's 50 pounds, or whatever the case may be, you can do the math, but just DM me, you know, we do the free nutritional counseling, and things like that as well, too, show you how to cook, show you how to meal prep, um, if you don't if you know how to cook, you don't know how to meal prep, and your, and your options are having to go grab, you know, fast foods, I can sit down and show you places to go, and things to get, and even McDonald's and those places like that where you can still work out and you can still, you know, go buy, you know, pay five bucks at McDonald's or pay El Pollo Local or these places where they can cook for you. You can get it quickly um, and you can still get the results um, that you want. Um, it's just a matter of just 
at the end of the day, just showing up and just following the things that I tell you to do. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining the program, brother. No problem tonight, man. Appreciate it. Anytime you want to have me on, man, uh, uh, you know, I'll definitely come on and, you know, help promote it, what you do. Um, you know, for us as fighters and athletes and personal trainers, um, the people that do this to take their time in the media and to, you know, you got the rig and the setup and do all that, uh, you know, it helps us because we have so much other things to worry about. We don't have time to, you know, to put ourselves out there on social media. You know, I get like a, a you know, maybe a minute or two, a two of posting my training videos a day on my Instagram, and that's all I get. So being able to come on and do a 30-minute, 30 35-minute segment with you, man, it helps and get my name out there, and, and I appreciate it.